Everybody can hear me? Okay, good morning. It's very much morning in Spain. Okay, after this, uh, I mean, quite philosophical end to a, a general presentation, I'm going to take you back to the, uh, the reality of processing of powders, hmm? particularly um, nano powders. I'll give a very brief introdu introduction. You've just seen uh, 45 minutes of ceramic processing. I'll talk a little bit more about powder characterization to complement the powder characterization that you saw yesterday, a couple of points which I think are very important, Bef and talk about the control of microstructure which we've seen from the first talk this morning, which is the key factor if we want to make new products and enter new areas. Huh? I'll mention powder dispersion, but I'll discuss that in great detail on Friday morning. Um, state of agglomeration, which is going to be the theme throughout the whole of the talk. We're talking about nano-sized powders. Um, state of agglomeration is very important. I'll briefly run through slip casting, talk a lot about drying, huh? um, look at a little bit about additives and compatibility. I can't possibly, in this short time, run through all the formulae, but you'll see in, in the uh, talks that follow, there'll be more details on the specific methods of forming. Huh? I'll talk a little bit about injection molding, and I think the, the key point, the most difficult part in the processing with respect to injection molding is, is the burnout of the binder. Huh? These removable additives that uh, Rainer mentioned in the last talk before some concluding remarks. Just to say I come from uh, Switzerland, uh, work at the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne. The uh, materials department is, is here, just four kilometers outside Lausanne. This is the, the Lake of Geneva, Genfese or Lac Léman, depending on which language you want to use. Switzerland uses lots of languages. Um, the materials department, we have uh, polymers, polymer composites, ceramics, metallurgy, building materials, and finally our group, powder technology. And you can see in the background, the uh, snow-capped mountains where I spend most of my weekends. I'm not so much of a water man, I'm much more of a mountain man. Huh? So, okay, ceramics, as we've seen, they come in all shapes and sizes, and it's this shape and size and final properties that dictates the powder forming method, and in fact, it dictates the type of powder we can use or need to use. Huh? So, we can take powders, I mean, we have our simple potter's wheel. I mean, quite often we do things when we, we mix with water. We can have our more complicated uh, screw injection molding where we form complicated shapes. Huh? And then we, once we've done this, we fire or sinter to form our ceramic. Huh? The properties depend on density. We saw a little bit about porosity and sintering in the first talk this morning. They depend on microstructures. The microstructures, are are controlled by your powder surfaces because these become grain boundaries after sintering. So basically, uh, our surfaces of the powders, the size, the shape, the type of surfaces are really very important in ceramic processing. Huh? So if we take the generalized view, we have our raw powder. We get it, we sample, but well, quite often we mix, we disperse, we may screen to take out any debris, and then we have our forming methods. Huh? So we've already seen We've gone through examples. We've seen the dry pressing example, and we have wet processing examples. Huh? We've seen the isostatic pressing example just a moment ago, injection molding. We have filter pressing, slip casting. But even the dry pressing route, we need to disperse the powder because we make granules for the pressing. And to make the granules, we disperse and we spray dry. Huh? Then, of course, we can have machining in the green state, as we saw. We burn out the binder, we sinter, and then you can have machining in the final state. We want to minimize this for the obvious reasons that ceramics are hard and can be quite difficult to machine. So basically, we want to control the microstructure. Huh? Mostly we want dense ceramics, you know, 99%. If we're lucky, we have applications with porous ceramics where we only have to do partial sintering. If we're really lucky, we don't have to do any sintering at all. And there's some applications like inkjet coatings, 
uh, or sensor applications for nanoparticle arrays where we can work with just the nanoparticle properties and we don't have to work with dense ceramics. And I'll show an example of that on Friday when I talk more about dispersion. So, as Rainer pointed out, to facilitate sintering, we want to minimize the shrinkage. We want to maximize the green density to pack in. We want a homogeneous pore structure, so we have to control this. I mean, do you or not want ordered structures? Depends on the particles you have. Packing also influences the rheology of suspensions. So this idea of how particles actually pack are important. And like Rainer said, lots of the processes we like in universities, a colloidal process in roots, but these are often used in industry too, and I'm sure uh, Professor Moreno will give some examples in the next talk. Hmm? So, why do we need quality powders, and what do small tails of agglomerates do? So this is a, a, a plot on a, on a log scale, so this is a logarithm of the diameter. This is the cumulative distribution on a probability curve, if we have a straight line, then the distribution follows a log normal distribution, okay? And we can see it's relatively straight, and then at the end we have this tail of agglomerates, so up to about 300 nanometers, and then above 300 nanometers we lose the log normal distribution. We have a second mode in our distribution, and these are aggregated, huh? If we look at the microstructure after a simple slip casting and sintering without optimization, we see this big uh, defect. So this powder is a commercial powder, high purity, but to transport dry powder, all manufacturers spray dry. Huh? Even if the powder is not meant for pressing, they spray dry to facilitate movement. Particles less than a micron are too difficult. They don't flow. You can't fill bags. So this is a, this is a hard granule from the spray drying, yeah? which becomes a defect in the ceramic and will kill your mechanical properties. Mm -hmm. So, and this is a high quality powder. You see also on a, on a, on a smaller scale, a couple of microns now, huh? we see these defects. So these are hard agglomerates, which when sintering, already have pore size which is a too big, and they don't disappear. Huh? If we attrition mill, huh? just for short period of time, 30 minutes, one hour, you can see that you can, you can change this tail, you can get rid of the agglomerates, and we have something which follows a log normal distribution, right up to 99% of the particles. So we can get rid of this tail. If we look at the microstructure of the ceramic, as sintered, slip cast, you get 94% density, and you have this huge distribution of grain sizes of several microns. If you take it's the same powder, it's just attrition milled, it's the same scale. We get 99% density, and we see grain sizes now are generally below a micron. So this small tail of agglomerates totally modifies the way the particles pack, the way they sinter, when we start closing porosity, and consequently the, the properties of your ceramic. Conclusion is, we need to characterize the powders at the beginning, and you need to do it well. If you are having problems with sintering, you probably don't have a sintering problem. You probably have a powder problem, and you need to characterize correctly at the beginning. Huh? This is excellent work, which shows this uh, particularly in, in detail. Huh? Okay, so for characterizing powders, I'm gonna put up a little list of the things that I think are really important. Particle size distribution, specific surface area, thermogravimetric analysis, imaging. If you don't have an image of your powder, any particle size measurement which assumes the particle is spherical is inherently wrong. Huh? So you have to have an idea of how close to, to spherical your particle is. Chemical analysis normally comes with the supplier's data. If not, even phase analysis, X-ray diffraction can be important. We heard about a 1% a impurity this morning which made the difference between certain zirconia developed in the 1980s. 1% you can see in X-ray diffraction. Huh? Sometimes powder density is important, like for things like barium titanate, where you're not too sure which phase is forming. Um, and if you're gonna use powders in dispersion, then you need the zeta potential and the rheological properties. With these, you've got an idea of what you can or cannot do with your powder. Huh? 
particle size distributions, I'm not going to go in through in detail. I quite often talk about this for three hours. So in one slide, generally get as much information as you can from the supplier. If the supplier can't give you detailed information on your powder, it is not the ceramic powder supplier. Huh? I mean, basically, you should already worry about it. Huh? You get a suitable image. Depends on the size of the powder you're looking at, if you're looking at granules or if you're looking at primary particles. Then you ask yourself, why am I measuring the size? Huh? Am I going to use this powder dry or am I going to use it wet? Okay? Then you choose a suitable net method. I mean, for 100 nanometers to about 1,000 microns, laser diffraction is a really good point to start as long as your particles are not shaped like rods. If they're shaped like rods, you're wasting your time. Huh? because they assume spheres in the optical model. For particles between 10 and, and 1,000 nanometers, I like disk centrifuges, huh? because they separate the particles, and you get analysis of particles being separated from a distribution. The problem about laser diffraction and photon correlation spectroscopy is they take the ensemble. So if you have a distribution that's a little bit too large, you end up biasing the size distribution, as was mentioned yesterday by Giovanni Baldi, is the photon correlation spectroscopy. I give a limit of 500 nanometers. Down to two is sort of OK. Below 50 is really very, very difficult. If you don't have narrow size distributions, you have to be very, very careful. For elongated samples, the only way around it is image analysis. So there's a couple of um, papers which, which review comparison with different techniques for a series of aluminas and silicas, which you might find interesting for more details. Ceramic processing, why a colloidal approach? I mean, if we, if we disperse something that's relatively poor, so we have lots of agglomerates, huh? they're not well dispersed, they come down, I mean, this, in any sort of forming method, they start forming a loose and open structure with a low green density. Huh? So all of you who've played the game Tetris, understand the game. Huh? As things come down, as the shapes get more awkward, you can't fill in the space. Huh? If you have something that's well dispersed, huh? we have a slow network formation, we have repulsive potential between particles, we can force something that's close, packed, we can get high green densities, we have less work to do in the sintering. I mean, F Fred Lang, working with Norton saint Gobain, eliminated agglomerates from silicon nitride processing, homogeneities which were greater than five microns, then after sintering the full density with hot isostatic pressing, huh? they improved the properties by a factor of three huh? by taking out these small heterogeneities. This was pointed out by Professor Kaplan this morning. I mean, basically, what we're looking at in all these strength measurements is the size of the critical flow. And so what you want to do is reduce the size of the critical flow. If the critical flow is due to dust in your processing environment, then you can use any nanopowder you like, but you're not going to improve it. And if the nanopowder is aggregated, again, you're not going to improve it. So a key factor is to control this particle packing. Take a simplistic view of packing of spheres, uh, cubic, face-centered, we can have high. If they're random close packed, we get 64% if we have random so spheres. Problem, in reality, we have a distribution of sizes, and we can have particles which are non-spherical. Uh, so then it really depends if you have an ordered structure or a disordered structure, how the packing changes with respect to the shape. If we, if you have a random structure, it always decreases if your particles are not spherical for random packing. Huh? So some, some modeling by Nolan and Cavana took a log normal distribution, so we're no longer working with the, the perfect monodispersed sphere of, of our dreams. So here we have the 64% packing when we have a geometric standard deviation of one. This is uh, monodispersed. And as the dispersion, we can see as the distribution increases, in fact, we increase our packing factor. So having a small distribution is not bad for actually improving the packing. Huh? This was understood intuitively that small particles came in and filled the gaps between the big particles. But in fact, the modeling showed, which is why I also like a theoretical approach, that there are not enough fine particles in the log normal distribution to fill the gaps between the big ones. What you have in these very broad size distributions, which means you have uh, several orders of magnitude difference in the particle sizes, is you have one or two very, very big particles which have no porosity. Huh? So you have areas. This is not necessarily good if you want a nice homogeneous microstructure at the center in. Huh? 
So there's a limitation to the width of distribution you can use. Although sometimes you can use the bimodal distribution, as was pointed out by uh, Rainer Gado in the last talk for this silicon carbide uh, example. Now, if we're talking about nanoparticles, we have primary particles. These particles can aggregate, and normally we measure the size of the aggregate. The question is, what is this size and how do we characterize it? Huh? I mean, whether it's an agglomerate during forming or aggregates from synthesis, huh? if we pack these, we have pores within the aggregate, between the aggregates, we have a bimodal pore size distribution, and if then we try and sinter, we densify, we densify depending on the packing in the aggregate, we can, we can densify in the aggregate, between the aggregates we don't densify, and we see the type of defects that I showed you with the alpha alumina, with the tail of ag aggregates a few slides ago. Huh? So the problem is you get these stable interparticle pores, which you can never get rid of. So number one is characterize your powders and make sure you get rid of your aggregates. One way you can do that in a quantitative basis and not say, I have soft aggregates, I have hard aggregates, it means nothing, you need to figure out, we're scientists, huh? So if we have primary particles, this is our aggregate. Um, like I said, we can define an agglomeration factor or an agglomeration number. Huh? So if we take the agglomeration factor, if we measure the, the median size by X-ray disk centrifuge, huh? we measure the specific, the, the, the DBT, which is from the specific surface area, so we can calculate an equivalent primary particle diameter using this formula, where this is the specific surface area, this is the density. Yeah? This assumes that we have monodispersed uh, primary particles and this varicel. Huh? We can also, this gives you a very good indication of the degree of agglomeration. Huh? We can also calculate the agglomeration number. So this, we have the, from the DBT, we can calculate the volume of a primary particle. And if we know the volume of the solid material in the aggregate, we can then take the ratio of volumes and then we get the number of aggregates per particle, yeah? number of primary particles in the aggregate, so we get an agglomeration number. Yeah? How many primary particles are in the aggregate? To do this, you need to know the porosity of your particle, which I generally tend to do using nitrogen adsorption desorption, we can get a, a porosity from this uh, aggregate, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily easy. But these give you a way to actually quantify the state of aggregation. Huh? I'm not going to talk any more about interparticle forces other than we have our attractive or dis dis dispersion of van der Waals forces, which tend to form our aggregates either during synthesis or during dispersion. We can counter this with electrostatic by putting charge on the surface, or steric by putting a polymer on the surface, or the both if you put a charged polymer. On Friday morning, I'll be talking 45 minutes about it and, for, and how you can actually make these calculations using a program on our website, which has been developed during the project uh, Nanoka. So, but we need the dispersed powders, it's important. Huh? The overall interaction energy is just the sum of all these things. So we have our attractive van der Waals forces, we have our charge, our, our steric repulsion from the polymer, we have our total repulsion, which then produces an interaction potential. H is the distance between the particle surfaces, so as the particles come together. If we're lucky, they feel a repulsive barrier when it's positive, attractive when negative, and then if the repulsive barrier is significant enough, we can stop the particles coming together and feeling this attractive minimum from the van der Waals forces. Um, this works generally quite well. Um, uh, Leonard Begstrom did some nice work in, in the early 90s. Uli Aschau has uh, created this program, uh, easy to use, that I'll describe on, on Friday in the modeling session. Huh? One of the reasons why we get good qualitative results is generally people don't take into the particle size distribution. The attractive force depends on particle size, and I'll discuss this in detail on Friday. But um, we've developed uh, a model looking at the yield stress of gels, or, or flocculated suspensions, trying to take into account particle size distributions and not depending just on our median diameter. Huh? So all these forces are taken into account 
And like I said, we'll discuss this in more detail on Friday. Huh? So, if we're talking about nano ceramics, our nano composites, one of the things was how, how to disperse these particles, how to get them into the structure. Or well, if you want to make a monolithic ceramic, agglomerates are often cited as a key factor. So, who here works on ceramics? Huh? You two work on, who works on ceramics? I work on ceramics. Yeah? So, uh, only 30% of the audience work on ceramics, is that correct? Or are you all afraid to put your hand in the air? Huh? I mean, I, mean I, I put my hands in there a lot when I dance, you know, but uh, I'm not dancing today, but I might dance a little bit more on Friday. Huh? So, only 30%. Okay, uh, you lot, who, uh, who, has, who has problems with agglomerates? Okay, so there are now more people who put their hands up with the problems with agglomerates than work on ceramics, so I'm succeeding, okay? So this is the key factor, yeah? This is really non-trivial, and as, and as Rainer said, you know, you don't have to be about ashamed about having a aggregates. If you're honest about aggregates, the only way to solve the problem is to be honest about it, say you've got it, and work on how to get rid of it, huh? So, little example for gamma alumina. Uh, where we, we have the phase transition from gamma to alpha is a key point. We want to make nanograin ceramics, reduce agglomeration. We use traditional slip casting. I mean, I don't know, several different methods can be possible. Maybe you want to try it. Maybe you want to use Spox plasma syndrome. It was going to be this afternoon, but um, well, it's not going to be now. Um, we look, we've been working on this for quite a few years. We looked at a couple of gamma luminous, one from Baikowski, one from Degusa. Huh? One is very pure, so it's quite good for doping studies. We don't ha we have uh, we have low, uh, less than 10 ppm silicon and calcium, so we don't have this intergranular problem with uh, the phase. The degussa C is a, bit, a little bit less. But you can see it. when we measure the particle surface areas are high, about 100 meters squared per gram. Primary particles are small, about 20 nanometers, but the, the CR125 as an agglomeration factor of 45. The degusa C is not too bad, only an agglomeration factor of two. Huh? So, if we take these, this is the side distribution. This is one micron. You can see that these particles are heavily aggregated. The degusa C disperses quite well. Most particles are below 100 nanometers. If you, if you then plot the degusa C, it seemed quite nicely dispersed, huh? but this aggregation factor is just an average, huh? and at 2.2, it's still relatively aggregated. This is a plot of the aggregation number huh? as a function of the size distribution. Huh? So you saw most of the particles are below 100 nanometers, but in fact, you, you have aggregation numbers. The average is, is about two, but lots of your particles have up to 80 primary particles. So you have to be very careful when you're looking at things. There's a size distribution. Huh? So if you have a narrow size distribution of primary particles, you can see the primary particles are quite nice. We've seen lots of images this morning. We saw lots of images yesterday where the primary particles look quite nice. They look quite homogeneous. But in fact, when it comes around to measure, you, you need the size distribution. And if you have a size distribution and the primary particles are quite homogeneous, you have an aggregation problem. <coughs> the easiest way to do it is attrition milling. We look at the Baikowski example. So this is what it looks like in the TEM. You see our nice primary particles. If we take the as-received powder, we, uh, we slip cast it, we get 34% green density. We try and sinter it, we get maximum 74% density. This is 1,600 degrees centigrade, where you saw this morning in the first presentation, 1,600 degrees centigrade, standard alumina powder. You expect 99% density, huh? okay? You have this problem of aggregation. One hour of attrition milling, aggregation factor has dropped to 6.3. You can follow it with a number. Huh? We get 97% synth density, a nicer microstructure. And then if we, if we take it for three hours, we can get the agglomeration factor down to 2.5. And we can get the synth densities up to 99.1. So basically, you can get there, but you need to get rid of aggregates. So, that's a little bit about characterization. That's our powder. 
Now we look a little bit at, at forming. Yeah? Um, like I said, we, we've seen these, these different methods. We'll highlight them in the next slide. So slip casting, you've seen the, the typical mold. Like Reiner said, in the lab, we use these simple cylindrical samples to study new products, processing of nanopowder. It's no, it's no problem. We suspend molded silicone. We have a filter to stop the, the nanoparticles going through. They form, in the end, their own filter because they're finer than the actual filter itself, but they block the filter in the end. We have a porous support. We form our nice cylindrical particles. Huh? Typical dispersant used is uh, polyacrylic acid, where we have our carboxylate groups at pHs greater than 5 or 6. These start dissociating, so we can have electrosteric uh, dispersion. You can slip cast at pH 6, pH 10, like I said, the molecular weight. We're using about 6% of this polyacrylic acid. When we have a high surface area, normally we need about 2 to 3 milligrams of polymer per gram of per meter squared of powder to disperse. When we have 100 meters squared per gram, we need a lot of polymer. You can get away with a, a little bit less than 6%, but uh, this is what we ended up using. You end up with only 15% volume solids. Huh? These are still aggregates. There's still an internal porosity in the aggregates. So this is, this is relatively low. But as you saw on the last slide, if you've, you've attrition milled, you can still get the 99% density with simple uh, with simple uh, natural sintering. Huh? Basically, these adsorb. They give you this charge and steric repulsion. And you can make these nice cylinders. The only problem with this is it takes you three to six days to dry it. Huh? So uh, slip casting with nano-sized powders, drying, is a non-trivial process. Huh? So this is not something that's really going to work very well on an industrial process. Um, what, why do we have this? If we analyze dry-in as a function of weight loss as time, basically this is the percentage weight, this is time, and we see we're dry-in, we're losing water as a function of time. There are three different periods, yeah? where here we have total dispersion, here we start forming a compact where all the particles touch, here we have a, we start the film is continuous on the particles here. The water or liquid starts intruding into the, into the ceramic as we dry. Huh? So like you say, there's this constant. So now we're looking at the rate. So this constant rate period when we have just the evaporation from the liquid surface, first falling rate period when we get the continuous film still through our, our porous structure, and when we get the second falling rate period, when we get the discontinuous film and we have to sort of transport uh, the liquid through the vapor phase. Huh? And basically, as we get this, we pass this critical point, huh? we get capillary forces, which then can drastically crack our material. Huh? So we've been working, the capillary forces will, will depend on, on the size of your pore, okay, the, surface tension of the liquid and, and our vapor, and the contact angle. Huh? So Frédéric Juira, in his thesis, I mean, looked at forming different types of sort of uh, colloidal nanostructures and looked at the dry-in in, uh, in detail. So here we've got a Teflon ring. We put our suspension in. So these are 80 nanometer silica spheres, relatively narrow size distribution. And then we let it dry. Huh? So we control the dry-in in a control cabinet. We control temperature, relative humidity. We have a balance and a microscope. So we can follow the dry-in in situ. Huh? So this is a little video which I'll try and run. So this is our Teflon ring. We dry in as a function of time. It's, it remains transparent. And all of a sudden, you see this catastrophic cracking. OK, it doesn't come up very good on the screen. But on the next slide, we'll see it. Yeah. So basically, you, have, you end up with this. Uh, catastrophic cracking, and the catastrophic cracking comes exactly at the start of the first falling period of dry-in. So it's exactly where you expect the classical problem of you get inhomogeneous capillary forces because you have inhomogeneous evaporation from within the structure because pore sizes and the pore structure 
are not identical. Huh? You can form nice structures with these, these nice particles huh, where you get long range orientation, you give long range even through uh, these uh, cuts through the, the different parts of, uh, of the dried process. But the big problem is if you want something more than a couple of microns, so for 10 to 100 microns, you can do it. Huh? You, you can have these nice areas. But once you want pieces greater than 100 microns, drying of nanomaterials starts becoming a bit of a problem. Huh? So if you, we looked at this in a little bit more detail, and we looked at our three, uh, this is the constant rate period, this is the critical point when we start moving into the, the first falling rate, where we get our particles start are in contact, and then we have the, uh, the two falling rate periods as we move through our system. The key factor is the maximum stress at this critical point. You can calculate it as a function of relative humidity and temperature and time. Huh? So you can go slower, you can go quicker, you can change relative humidity, you can change temperature, you can control the evaporation rate. Huh? But you can see that with respect to megapascals, you can get down to about 1.5. Without additives, this is not enough to stop these things cracking. Huh? So all these things depend on the interparticle forces. But the conclusion is, is that if you look at the particle-particle -particle interactions, particle-substrate interaction, the attractive forces, the capillary forces are several orders of magnitude greater than these interparticle forces, which I'll discuss in more detail on Friday. But basically, we're fighting against capillary forces. Huh? I mean, if you take uh, our gamma alumina, well milled, our degussa C, this is in ethanol. Huh? The zeta is modified, so we have a good electrostatic dispersion. This is wet. This is after 30 seconds. This is after five minutes. Catastrophic cracking. So even reducing the surface tension using ethanol is not enough often for nano-sized particles. Huh? So this is a gamma alumina with, a, nano with a, a dispersed particle size of 22 nanometers. Huh? So basically, it's very difficult to avoid. The only way we can do it is to have very thin films. So if we have one micron thick films, then the critical film thickness is not passed. We, we, can, we can create crack fear films, but this is limited. Huh? So if we look at bigger particles, we look at 165 nanometers. This is like the AKP50 I showed you in the first example. We can see that in this particular case, we're OK. We have big areas, no cracks, no problem. Basically, it depends on very simple. The particle packing gives you the pore size. The pore size gives you your capillary forces. Huh? I mean, this is what you need. Huh? You need to lower the interparticle, the, the, the critical capillary pressure. Huh? So the only way around that is to use additives. So you use 2 to 4% of polyacrylic acid dispersed, 10 to 15% of polyvinyl alcohol. So this then becomes the question. So we can formulate it. We can put in a lot. We can stop macro cracks. Yeah? We can get film thicknesses of, of 17 microns, which is what we were trying to do, that, do in this particular case. It's just then a question of, is this OK for your application? We were trying to make coatings for turbine blade applications. The sintered microstructure of this ceramic coating afterwards was sufficient for the application. It worked. Whether or not the use and burning out of such a quantity of binder for the application is uh, Economically viable is a big discussion. So you can get there, but you have to add binders. Huh? I mean, you can modify uh, interfacial uh, tension by reducing things from like 7.2 to 3.2. Uh, Chu and Seema showed that they can cr reduce below the 2 megapascal down to 0 0.9 megapascal with just use of surfactant. Really depends on your system, depends on your size. You can modify these things. These are the things you can play with. Surface tension, particle size, and use of additives. Huh? One of the things I think is really Im Im important, you can use a binder, you can use a UV, a curable ligand, yeah? in sort of, or gel casting. And Professor Rodrigo Moreno will talk a little bit about that in the next um, presentation. 
So we've heard a little bit about injection molding this morning. Basically, they're okay. Small pieces and complex shapes. You can make bigger pieces. Huh? The problem is the cost. Huh? When you're making the mold, huh? the mold has to be in a certain material. I mean, these things, you have a powder polymer mixture. Normally, it's heated up to 150, 200 degrees centigrade. You inject this very viscous medium, huh? like in using our, our screw extruder or our piston. Huh? Then we have to burn out the binder. If you have this huge quantity of polymer, which fills most of the porosity in our ceramic, we have to burn it out. But also, I mean, if you're doing big pieces, this mold for a typical precision piece, you know, complex shape, I mean, if you can press it, press it. Huh? If you can't press it and you need a more complex shape, you have to move to this molding type of technique. But these pieces, even for small pieces of um, about one centimeter, huh? They cost 50,000 euros, huh? the actual mold to make. So you can't make quick experiments in injection molding. It has to be something where there's a lot of pieces to be made, there's a lot of money to be made afterwards, and you have to make sure it's the right process. Huh? So you inject, quite often there's this excess, yeah? so you need all the tubes to get into the piece to make sure the access, the pressure is correct. If you process cleanly, you can reuse these pieces. You can you reuse these pieces up to five times. If you work cleanly enough, if you work in labs, the lab that I, the industry I work with in Switzerland, I mean, they use these up to five times, but their floors are cleaner than my kitchen, huh? Mind you, I mean, my kitchen's quite clean. Huh? I, mean, I, I should bring, a, I should bring a, a, a photograph of my kitchen to convince you of that next time, huh? Okay. So, these are the type of pieces we can make, very complex shapes, huh? Very difficult to make by any other method. What do we put in? For a typical sort of uh, formulation for alumina, we use an oil as a plasticizer. Things have to move. We have these, we have these ceramic particles. We have, to, we have to avoid friction between the particles, so we need lubricants. The oil alcohol can also act as a dispersant. So another plasticizer, we have our binder, fluidizer when it's hot. Huh? And so we can see we have a, a big series of different components. And this is one of the reasons why Rainer Gaddow's hope that we can be a little bit more scientific about uh, injection molding is very difficult. It's a very, very complex system, and most industrialists don't tell you the formulation they use. This is the most well-kept secret they have. Hmm? So, bind the burnout. Normally, we follow the weight loss as a function of time. I mean, this is really very important. Huh? Normally, it's just a simple heat in slow rate. So we have to give the, we have to give the organics enough time to come out. Huh? So we heat up, normally up to about 500, 600 degrees centigrade. We have a little bit of water, excess solvent. This, this is typical for a slip gas with polyacrylic acids, where we only have one component. This comes out about 250 degrees centigrade. Polyacrylic acid is quite nice because it depolymerizes and doesn't leave a carbon residue. Huh? So mechanisms can be evaporation, oxidation, or decomposition. You need to avoid reticulation. If you form a carbonaceous material and then these are difficult to eliminate before sintering, you can actually get swelling, cracking of a ceramic piece due to the high pressures if you start forming carbon dioxide in a closed pore. Huh? So there are several examples in the literature where you actually get a swelling of, of an increase in the dilatometry of the particles due to this incomplete binder burnout. Huh? So like I said, injection molding, quite often what you do is you use a series such that you get small steps, and each one burns out at a different temperature, which releases the, the pressure. Sometimes they, you, know, you leave a little bit in at the end, Otherwise, your particle, otherwise your, your piece can't be handled. Huh? So you can stop at a certain temperature, leave one of the components in, and then burn that out just before sintering. Otherwise, your piece loses its mechanical properties. OK, so we've seen characterization of the powder, very important. Forming method really depends on the shape and application. Yeah? The powder will also give you an idea of properties. So the powder, 
is also important, but the shape is dictated by the application, property is dictated by the powder. You can machine at the end, huh? I won't talk about that today, but one little example of quality powder versus machining at the end is the silicon nitride bearings for diesel engines. Huh? Saint-Gobain started off looking at, at this. There were two powders which were reasonably uh, available on the market. One cost 10 times the price of the other, so they said, okay, we're going to use the cheap one. So they used the cheap one, went all the way through, but they had to do a lot of machining at the end, huh? because with the cheap powder, broader size distribution, it was difficult to get the tolerances that Professor Gadow was talking about to get the tolerances, they had to do too much machining. The finishing cost 25% of the whole product chain. They used the expensive powder 10 times in price, and they reduced the machining by a factor of two, and reduced the whole process, was cheaper using a powder that was 10 times more expensive. So quality powder counts. Huh? So. Basically what you do in conclusion, what form or shape, and then you decide the form and method. What properties do you, does your ceramic need? You choose the powder. You characterize the starting powder. I mean, in our lab, we have six instruments for measuring particle size distribution. We have zeta, two instruments for zeta potential. We spend a lot of time characterizing, but boy, does it save us a lot of time when we come round to sintering. I frequently get people who come in, they've been doing six, nine months of their PhD in other groups, they come in and say, I've got a sintering problem. I have not once, not once in the last 15 years have we had a sintering problem. The problem has always been a powder and processing problem. Sometimes synthesis even, which is a little bit more tricky because powder synthesis is a game all in its own. Huh? Basically, you have to characterize. You disperse the mix in, disperse the powder. You need high shear forces to break up agglomerates. If ultrasonic treatment isn't enough, you have to mill it. If you mill, you contaminate. You just have to make your contaminant is positive, like, like the, the story told by Reina Gado this morning. Um, there are several examples of contaminants being positive, and when we clean it up, things don't work, but then you just turn to doping. Huh? You need repulsive forces to overcome the attractive van der Waals forces. We'll talk a lot about that on Friday. You need surface charge or a steric barrier. You choose your additives to assure the green body has mechanical properties for handling, for transfer, and like I say, especially for drying of nano-sized powders, you need additives or you need clever gel casting approaches. You have to be careful to consider compatibility of additives. Huh? Polyvinyl alcohol and polyacrylic acid, at a certain ratio of composition, they're not compatible, they segregate. Huh? So then you create the segregation of your polymeric additives, which is quite problematic. Uh, citric acid and polyvinyl alcohol are not compatible. Huh? So there's lots of examples of incompatibility. You have to be careful when you choose the additives that they are compatible. Huh? You have to remove them before sintering. Huh? All these things are very often system dependent. You have to optimize a recipe for each system. The fundamental idea is simple. You characterize, you disperse, you form high density, homogeneous green compacts. Yeah? Life is much easier afterwards. Huh? But each system normally needs, I don't know, three to six months experimentation to optimize. So really, characterization for me is the starting point. And I think most nanoceramic studies that I've seen over the past five to 10 years, it's normally the biggest stumbling block. So really, try and do it. So with that, I'll acknowledge a series of people who've helped uh, throughout the years. And naturally, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.